Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Nashville Lawyers Chapter of the Federal Society sponsored uh, public policy debate. I'm Joseph Woodruff from uh, the Ronald Lanson Law Firm. Let me first begin by expressing our gratitude and thanks to the law firm of Bolt Cummings, Connors, and Berry for hosting today's event. And I especially want to single out and, and thank uh, Russ Morgan and Janet Sumi of the Bolt Cummings firm for all their hard work in making uh, today's event possible. Uh, by way of uh, administrative matters, uh, uh, I'm sure you've all found the refreshments that are in the lobby. Uh, if, uh, if you need a, a comfort moment, uh, please step through the doors at the rear of the, of the room, cross the lobby, through the next set of doors, <coughs> through a single door into a blue room, <laughs> and then it's moving out on the street. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and the, the facilities uh, uh, will be back by the blue room. Um, again, we, we express our gratitude to Bolt Cummings for making this fabulous uh, facility available to us for this event today. We're very privileged uh, to have uh, two very distinguished advocates uh, to uh, participate in today's debate on the subject of whether judicial elections are good public policy or not. Uh, we have with us uh, from uh, the Alabama Supreme Court, Associate Justice Harold C., and uh, late of the Attorney General's Office uh, and the Court of Criminal Appeals and, and other uh, judicial positions, which I will detail uh, more in just a moment, uh, General Paul Summers as our advocates. In Alabama, Democratic and Republican candidates, and sometimes other third-party candidates, <coughs> compete in contested partisan elections. During Alabama's last election cycle in 2006, uh, Alabama voters elected a Democrat, uh, Chief Justice Sue Bell Cobb, while Republicans secured the other seats that were out on the court. Justice C would likely concede that Alabama's system for choosing judges is not perfect. But he would, I assume, know that it is open to the public and facilitate judi judicial accountability. In addition, Alabama's system of seating judges comports with its state constitution, which states that Alabama's appellate judges, quote, shall be elected by the qualified electors. Alabama holds contested judicial elections. Tennessee's constitution uses almost identical language. Uh, stating that uh, judges of the Supreme Court shall be elected by the qualified voters of the state. However, Tennessee does not hold traditional contested elections. Uh, the plain language of both constitutions is perhaps a sufficient basis alone for supporting judicial elections. But instead, Tennessee has adopted its own system of judicial appointment known as the Tennessee Plan. As the General Assembly considers whether to allow that plan to sunset this year, we at the National Chapter of the Federal Society believe it is an important time to consider whether contested judicial elections would be a good method for seating appellate judges and whether it is good public policy to have <coughs> judicial elections and all that, uh, all the trappings that come with them. Our two guests are uniquely qualified to opine on this issue. Justice C. was elected to the Alabama Supreme Court in 1996 and re-elected in 2002. <laughs> Prior to joining the court, he was a law professor at the University of Alabama for more than 20 years. He is a, uh, an avid uh, advocate for and, and supporter of contested judicial elections and often speaks around the country on this issue. Justice C. has run and lost, he has run and won, and he's run for re-election and won. Uh, no doubt. I, I suspect that he would agree that winning is better than losing. Yeah, but mainly you just want it over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, General Paul Summers served Tennessee as its attorney's gen attorney general from 1999 to 2006. He's also served as a judge on the Tennessee Court of Criminal Appeals, having been appointed to the bench by Governor McWhorter in 1990 and retained through retention elections in 1992 and 1998. Uh, he's currently my law partner, Wall and Lansing Norton Davis. General Summers has been elected by the voters of, uh, of, a, of a judicial district as a circuit judge. He has been appointed 
He has been evaluated and retained in accordance with the uh, yes no procedure of the Tennessee uh, Merit Plan. And he has been appointed to a, a, a judicial office as Attorney General by the Supreme Court. Just about every way you can be appointed to a judicial or achieve a judicial office in the state of Tennessee, General Summers has experience. <coughs> a word about our format. Uh, each advocate will be given 10 minutes to make an opening statement. Uh, then they will have five minutes each to uh, cross-examine the other. This will be followed by questions from the audience that will be submitted in writing. And uh, you'll notice at the end of your at the end of your row there are note cards. So if you have any questions that occur to you uh, during the course of uh, the advocates' uh, opening statements or their own cross-examination of each other, please write them down on the card and give them to Jeff. Or otherwise, get them up to me, and uh, I'll I'll call through them and and uh, we'll ask the questions from the audience. Uh, following the audience questions, each advocate will be given a closing statement. By prior arrangement, a General Summers, who is uh, an opponent of judicial elections and believes that uh, contested elections on a partisan basis of uh, appellate judges is bad public policy, will go first. General Summers. Thank you very cool. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. All right. First, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to be uh, to be on this debate with Justice C. It's been a great pleasure for me to actually meet him, to have lunch with him. Uh, I, I've been talking with various of my partners about Justice C. Uh, he is a true gentleman, and it's my pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you, Woody, and thank you, Ammon, for inviting me, and and thank everybody uh, for coming. Uh, the good news is that we're going to be discussing a policy uh, today and opinions on a policy. The bad news, Mac, is we're not going to debate the Tennessee plan as to its constitutionality. And I'm sure that with John Jay and Mac in the room, it's going to come up. But, but that is history as far as I'm concerned, especially since uh, uh, Magistrate Judge Brown was in the back, and I think he wrote the latest opinion on that subject. Uh, but at any rate, uh, at any rate, my position uh, as to be asked to be on this particular panel is what is my position as to whether or not judges should be elected or whether they should be in some other type of selection process. Let's break it down first as to how judges get their jobs in America. And I'm specifically talking about state courts. You have two basic types of elections. You've got what we consider to be partisan elections, where R's run against D's or run against I's. And then you've got nonpartisan elections, primarily independent candidates. So that's your, that's your election type of category. Now, everything else probably includes the following, permutation or combination. In some states, the governor appoints, and that person's appointee is confirmed by the legislature. Or in some states, the governor appoints, and his or her appointment is later elected. In some states, the judges are elected by the legislature of that particular state. In some states you have a retention plan such as the one that was envisioned by Missouri several years ago and adopted by Tennessee circa 1971 and then in some states like Tennessee you have a combination of a merit selection retention plan. 39 states elect some or all of their judges in what we consider to be a, quote, popular election, unquote. Of course, we know what the federal system is like, and that is the, gov the president appoints, and then it's, uh, the uh, appointee is confirmed by the Senate. How does Tennessee select its judiciary? Uh, I'm sure this is ancient history for some of you, but just kind of an overview. Uh, primarily in your 31 judicial districts, your trial judges, and in the counties, your general sessions judges are elected in some type of popular election uh, in either their county or in case of a circuit judge, chancellor, or criminal court judge in that particular person's district. 
They are elected for an eight-year term. Sometimes they run in partisan elections, depending on the district. Sometimes they run in nonpartisan elections, all of them running as independents. If a vacancy occurs on a trial bench, then after the Judicial Selection Commission recommends three names to the governor, the governor selects that vacancy, that, uh, selects a person to fill in that vacancy, and then he or she serves until the next biennial election in August. That's the trial judges. Appellate judges are a little bit different. Appellate judges run on the Tennessee plan, also commonly called the modified Missouri plan. Appellate judges, whether they be Supreme Court, Court of Criminal Appeals, or Court of Appeals, they run on truly a merit selection plan. You have two commissions. Number one, a judicial selection commission, which is composed of selectees by the, by the Speaker of the House and the Speaker of the Senate after various groups like the Tennessee Trial Lawyers, the Tennessee Bar Association, the public defenders and district attorneys make recommendations as to who should be on the selection commission. The selection commission then selects someone, a list of three, on a li on to, to submit to the governor, and from that list, the governor makes a selection. Now, before the next biennial August election in Tennessee, that person then must go before another commission called the Judicial Evaluation Commission, consisting, if I recall correctly, of uh, 15, 14 or 15 people who are, who are selected by the, same, by the same selectees, basically, by the same selectors, rather. And these, the Judicial Evaluation Commission, which consists of not only lawyers, but also laymen and judges, makes recommendations as to whether or not that person should be retained or whether that person should not be retained by a vote. I think there are 12 on that commission. They have to have a vote of six, have to have a vote of seven. Judge Wiedemeyer, for example, on the Court of Criminal Appeals, before he can run at the next election, he's got to get seven votes on the Judicial Evaluation Commission. If a judge does not get the evaluation, then it becomes a an open partisan election just like in the old days. Now, that's an overview. How did we have it before the elect selection commission process? In Tennessee, back before 19, back before the back before the, the Tennessee plan came into effect, the voters of Tennessee, we had a we had a partisan or if you wanted to be, if you wanted to run as an independent, a nonpartisan election in Tennessee for the Supreme Court, for the Court of Criminal Appeals, and for the Court of Appeals. In 1971, the, tennis, the Missouri plan came into effect. However, when Winfield Dunn was governor three years later, the Democrats decided that he, there might be a possibility that he would appoint too many, that he would appoint too many Republicans, so they took the Supreme Court out of it. And then the Supreme Court stayed out of the Tennessee plan until 1994 when it was put back in. But when we were electing people popularly, it took 34 votes, it took 34 votes to become a justice on the Supreme Court. How did that work? I'll tell you how it worked. Back before the Tennessee plan, Republicans just couldn't win. Not true today, but Republicans were just completely, completely in the, in the dark, in the cold, so far as being elected to the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals, or the Court of Criminal Appeals. In January, before the election year, the Democratic Executive Committee would meet in caucus over in the House chambers, and the 66 members of the Democratic Executive Committee would decide who was going to be on the list of five for the Supreme Court, or on the list of nine at that time for the Court of Criminal Appeals, or on the list of nine at that time for the Court of Appeals. And whoever the Democratic Executive Committee decided would be on that slate would be the, would be the next Supreme Court Justice. Sometimes the Republicans wouldn't even field a slate of five because they knew that it was a fate accompli. They weren't going to get elected. Not true today. The Tennessee plan primarily was devised to 
to, at that time to help the minority party, the Republicans, get some members on the appellate court. That's what happened. But when they talk about, well, we used to have partisan elections in Tennessee, we ought to elect the Supreme Court. It was partisan in the sense that if you had 34 votes, you were going to be on the Tennessee Supreme Court. Reasons to elect. Reasons not to elect. Reasons to elect, ladies and gentlemen. Number one, people have a say. Next, people can contribute and people can politic and they can put up poll signs. Next, it allows any lawyer to be a judge if he or she could get 25 signatures on a ballot by people in the state of Tennessee. Next, it promotes judicial restraint. Next, 39 states elect some or all of the judges, so they must be right. Next, maybe it's okay for trial courts, so if it's okay for trial courts, then it ought to be okay for appellate courts. Reasons not to elect. Number one, remove politics. Number two, removes partisanship. Number three, removes racial bias. Number four, removes gender bias. Number five, more even-handed justice. Number six, don't have to rely on the Democratic or the Republican Executive Committee. Number seven, judges are not bought and paid for, or at least the perception is that they're not bought and paid for. Number eight, special interest groups aren't all that influential like they used to be with the trial lawyers, the Tennessee, the, the Tennessee Education Association and Labor. We don't have a pay-to-play justice system to elect. And finally, the screening gets better and the quality gets better than having to get 25 names on a petition to run for election. Those are the reasons not to elect. I think my time's up. short story and uh, the uh, narrator uh, speaking of the main character uh, used a variation of something H.L. Mencken once said I like his version better though this, uh, the, this short story writer's version he said of the, can of the uh, person, uh, the main character a moment's thought would have made this obvious to him but a moment is a long time and thought a difficult process I'd ask that we, uh, that we take a moment's thought about some of these considerations. And uh, let me say, first of all, there's no, such, there's no perfect system. My father used to tell me, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You know, don't, uh, don't, don't, because you find something is imperfect, uh, reject it. You know, what we ought to do, a moment's thought makes this obvious to us, is to compare. Are there problems? You know, what, what we normally hear, and, 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 and let me say we didn't, we didn't hear it put quite this way uh, today, what we normally hear is that elections are expensive and they're nasty. Therefore, we should have merit selection. It seems to me there's something missing in that analysis. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, so they're nasty, so they're expensive, but what about the alternative? Is the alternative better or worse? Now, I, you know, I'm, I'm here advocating for uh, uh, for the elective process. I, I certainly, though, don't don't consider it to be uh, a perfect system. The uh, I guess, in fact, we, we heard this comment: Why should we have a Tennessee plan instead of elections? Why? Well, uh, the, the the statement is because we'll get better quality, right? Unfortunately, the social science research 
does not support that. Uh, Melissa, uh, I'm trying to remember her name now, Melinda, I think it is, Gann uh, Gan Hall, who has written extensively in this area, wrote in the Journal of Political Science in 1992, empirical research on the effects of judicial selection processes has been quite consistent in finding that methods of judicial recruitment do not affect either the quality of the bench or judicial outcomes. Likewise, studies demonstrate selection methods do not affect the tendency for state Supreme Courts to rule in favor of particular categories of litigants. Based on the evidence to date, the conclusion reasonably could be drawn that selection mechanisms simply do not have much of an impact on the operation of state judiciaries. Now, it'd be nice, uh, for the standpoint of elections, if I could say, well, look, uh, they're, they're higher quality. No, it's just, we don't, don't see much difference. When you look at the, the best of the ability of the social scientists, uh, when, you, when you look, you find they're roughly the same. Don't see any noticeable uh, difference uh, in quality. Uh, how about this uh, expense in tone? Gosh, it's so, you know, all these expensive elections and there are ugly things being said, therefore, well, now, let's see. Therefore, this is the Tennessee plan, you know, Missouri plan, uh, uh, so-called merit selection. Uh, and, and I'd urge you to use a moment, take a moment's thought about words like merit selection and partisan election and what they really mean. Um, but uh, uh, we, we, we have uh, an appointive system in the, uh, in the federal government. Uh, so let's think about that. Let's see. They don't have ugly uh, appointment process, right? Uh, Clarence Thomas has high elevated uh, discussion of who would be the best uh, uh, justice. Uh, it, they don't spend money, right? Uh, uh, the, the confirmation of Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito, non-controversial if you remember, they spent $15 million. That, you know, well, let me ask this question, why? Why are they spending this money? Because judges have a great deal of influence in our country. And because there are interests that are concerned about how judges are going to decide. Because they have that concern, they're willing to invest money. Now, stop and think about it. Let's suppose somebody's willing to invest a million dollars in the election of a judge. Why? It's worth a million dollars to them. Now, suppose Instead, you have an appointed system. Is it suddenly not worth a million dollars? It's worth the same thing, isn't it? It's just a question of where you put the money. The only reason we know about the Alito and Roberts money is because they spent it on television and mailings and things of that sort where we could see it. If it's a commission, it's still worth a million dollars to get the right people on the commission deciding the right way to select the right people. It's just you can't see it. The nastiness. You hear nasty comments made about people in elections because it's the voters who decide they're the ones you've got to convince. If it's an appointed process, you think they're not going to say ugly things? They're just going to say them behind closed doors. They're going to say them to the decision makers. And the person about whom they're being said isn't going to know. Isn't going to have a chance to respond. At least in an election, you can get out there and say, this isn't true. In an appointed process, you may never know. Gosh, I wonder why they didn't pick me. You'd probably never find out. Um, let's see here. Independence and legitimacy. We want our judges to be independent. But we don't want them to be independent of the law, do we? The idea in our tripartite system of government is that we want a separation of powers. We want that so that all power doesn't concentrate in a single set of hands in order to protect our freedom. That, that, that's, that's why we want the, the separation of powers. So we want an independent judiciary. What gives us the, the, the best chance at an independent judiciary? To have the legislature, which is by far the most powerful branch, you know, look at your British history, uh, the legislature uh, being the ones who have the input into who the judges are and whether the judges get to stay, uh, the governor, the member of the executive branch, or is it better to have an independent base for judges? That is, they're elected by the public. In the initial days of our, uh, of our country, virtually every state, well, Vermont was the exception. Vermont had elected judges. Everybody else followed the federal system, appointed judges. 
lawyers who were concerned about reform you know, were troubled by the politics that was going in, the backroom dealings, and the, and the way that, uh, that they perceived judges were in the pockets of governors and legislatures. And they went to an elective system. Why? Because they thought it was better to have judges answerable to the people than answerable to one of the two branches. And that's consistent, of the other two branches, that's consistent with our notions of a separation of powers, to have judges elected. Now, there are some, there, there are some objections uh, to that, uh, of course. Uh, the, uh, the, the criticism is that, uh, uh, well, they don't even know who their judges are, right? The way you usually hear it is stop, stop some people on the street and ask them who's on their Supreme Court. I'll bet you they can't tell you. All right, therefore, we should have a system uh, with a commission that uh, nominates three to the governor, and the governor picks one of those three. Stop those same people and ask them, who's your state representative? Who's your state senator? Maybe we should have a commission of lawyers to get, select three names to submit to the governor to appoint a state representative or state senator. Well, of course, the fact is, yeah, there are lots of folks uh, there are lots of officials that people on the street, if you stop them on a given day, uh, can't identify. But that doesn't mean that democracy doesn't work. Ask them about the person they understand is not performing the job right. In general, incumbents get reelected. If everything's going fine, people vote for them. But when they hear something wrong about someone, when they believe that there's someone who's not performing the job the way he's supposed to be performing the job, they know who to vote against. What a contested elections do is provide that information. There's someone with an incentive to get out there and say, look, you know, th this guy's not doing right. You know, this judge isn't acting like a judge or, or you know, for in some other uh, area, not, not uh, acting like a legislator or a governor or whoever it is. Uh, there is someone with incentive to do that. Now, of course, under the Tennessee plan, there's no incentive to do that, not because there's no opponent. I mean, first of all, there's an appointment, then when the election takes place, there's no, no opponent. And even if somebody wanted to get rid of him, what are they going to get? In other words, it's like it. Right? You don't have a choice. You can vote against someone and have the same people that gave you that one give you another one. Um, let's see. I think there's... Um, okay. Um, well, let, let, me, let me make a a major point. Um, well, no, 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 let me make the next related point. Uh, the other question is, are voters really smart enough to elect judges? Or do they not understand the judicial role and therefore they ought not be exercising this, this judgment? Well, I think they do. I mean, out there, it seems to me what they, their view is that judges ought to apply the law. Right? Legislators ought to make it. Judges ought to apply the law. That's what the Constitution calls for. Seems to me they understand. I mean, it takes a legal education, doesn't it, to get any other view about what judges ought to do. There is, though, today, a dispute over judicial philosophy. Right? There are those who believe judges ought to do what's right, regardless of the law, of uh, judicial activism, conservative or liberal. There are those who believe judges ought to do what the law requires. I think that's a constitutional question. And if it is a constitutional question, as that judges should be a separate branch of, of government performing a judicial function, if it's a, that's a constitutional question, I think the people ought to have a right to choose. People ought to have a right to exercise judgment as to whether these judges are doing what they're supposed to be doing or not. And I don't think having a commission essentially composed of lawyers is the answer that most folks out there would choose. You know, I, for me, it's fine. I like lawyers. I deal with lawyers. They're going to look after my interests. Uh, I'd be less satisfied if the commission were made up of realtors, I think. Uh, but it seems to me that if you believe in democracy, if you trust the voter, it makes a whole lot of sense to have the judges, uh, have, have, the, have the electorate exercise their judgment as to who is performing a judicial function. Thank you. General Summers, uh, you now have five minutes uh, to uh, cross-examine uh, 
Justice C on his uh, positions. Uh, Justice C, you said that you said that under the Tennessee plan, which I'm not going to hold you to know it all the issues. I, I don't. You, you, you may correct me. I may discover some right. greatest well, things in size red. You know, there is a, uh, in, the, in the retention part of the Tennessee plan, there is ample opportunity for a judge not to be retained two ways. Number one, they may not get out of the Judicial Evaluation Commission by a vote of 75 in which event there will be a contested or a nonpartisan contested race in Tennessee. That's number one. Or, if they do get out of the Judicial Selection Commission after their performance has been evaluated, then the voters might not elect them or might not retain them by a vote of 50% plus one vote. Doesn't that give the voters an opportunity to make a choice as to whether or not what their performance is good or bad? On what information? Well, for one thing, uh, the Judicial Evaluation Commission, which consists of 12 people, uh, they meet about seven months prior to the first Thursday in August election every eight years. Uh, after they evaluate, and the evaluation come from the public, come from court clerks, come from lawyers who've been involved, and come from the other judges. And then they also interview the judges and look at the judge's record and look at the way he or she's been writing their opinions and look at whether or not they've been timely. And then they come out with a report which they produce in five major newspapers uh, on a Sunday in March prior to the August election and also puts it on the administrative office of the court website. So the public has a the public has a lot more information about how an appellate judge is operating for the last two years or eight years than in any other office in the state of Tennessee, including the governor, the legislature, the city. So isn't that an informed electorate when they go to the ballot box? Well, you know, if, if we do, I to be together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll get back. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 well, I mean, you, I think suppose, suppose the thing to do is stop and think. Let's suppose we did that for presidential elections. We said, well, we've got a commission. And the commission is going to interview the candidates and going to give you information on what, how they've performed their previous jobs. And we're going to publish that in the leading newspapers. And they're going to have it on a website. Now, isn't that enough of information to elect the president? I, it is useful. I'm for it. I think you ought to have it. I, you know, if, if, the, if there were a commission doing it, I think the Bar Association ought to do it. And I think other people ought to do it as well. I think you know, other groups ought to get together. And, you know, the, the, the plaintiff's bar, the you know, chamber of commerce, I, mean, I think those folks ought to gather this information and put it out there. Uh, so, so, yeah, I'm all in favor of information, but is that sufficient information? Well, it's going to depend on the commission, isn't it? And you may have a fantastic commission today. You may not have a fantastic commission 10 years from now. Because there are going to be people who have an interest in who's on that bench, and they're and they're going to be investing money and in making sure that the right folks are on that bench. Your your election last time you ran cost you right at two million dollars. I think it's a little under. Yeah. Uh, when you ran the time before, your election cost you two point four million dollars. Right. That's right. Uh, your colleague, the only Democrat on the Alabama Supreme Court, is. Uh, is Sue Bell Cobb, and her election last year cost about $2.6 million. I think it was a little more than that. Are you familiar with the comment that when she was, when she was right after she was elected Chief Justice last year, she was asked, you know, you know, she was asked some questions about her perception of the race. You, are you familiar with some of her comments? I, I, I suspect I'm familiar with virtually all well, of them, but I don't know which one you're let me, let me ask you what you think about <laughs> Chief Justice Sue Bell's comment when she said that instead of being asked, Justice, Chief Justice, how do you feel about being the at least the first woman in recent times being elected Chief Justice? Uh, how do you feel about to being the only Democrat? Now, she wasn't asking you those questions. She was asked, and I want, I want you to comment on it. She was asked and she responded about Chief Justice, what do you think about having spent $2.6 million? And she said that, quote, I think that it's unacceptable. 
People need to have faith in the courts. Raising large amounts of money does not give us an independent judiciary. Now that's your Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court, your colleague. What do you, what, what, what's your comment about her, her comment? I didn't, I, well, I, I think it misses a whole lot. Um, it, that, that's a lot of money. And, uh, and as, I, as I mentioned, the, one of the complaints is normally raised is, well, gosh, they're expensive. You, you, you may also remember that Alito and Roberts cost a whole lot more than that. Um, but, uh, but information, getting information out uh, is an expensive proposition. Uh, our governor spent $28 million. Uh, our legislature spent, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was, uh, I think it was 20, uh, somewhere like $25 million to be elected. It, it, it costs money to get that information uh, out there. Would I like it to be free? Yeah. In fact, I asked the newspaper editor to complain about the money that was spent on judicial elections. I said, well, will you run our ads for free? And he said, no. Well, where, did, where did Sue Bell Cobb get most of her money? From what type of organization? Was it off the internet by five dollars oh, a week? No, no, no. I, but I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I, I didn't look at I didn't look at her financial disclosure. Where did you raise most of your money? Uh, well, I had I had thousands of contributors. So a whole lot of it was from that, and others, uh, you know, there was back money. I've always I've been a defender of back money because you don't know who gave it. Um, but uh, you know, that, that was, would you would you say that the bulk of your money came from trial? <coughs> No, no. How about from the business industry? Uh, from individuals from the business community. Okay. So the trial lawyers probably know. Well, I had I had donations from trial lawyers, but not a lot. Which, and I'm sure Sue Bell Cobb had a lot more donations from trial lawyers. Sue Bell being a Democrat probably got most of her funding from trial lawyers. Uh, yeah, I did not look at it. I, I, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Now, I, I, don't, I don't have any, I, and I understand, I don't have any question about your integrity. I know you. I know people who know you. And I know you're an honorable man, you're an honest man, but don't you think that gives the impression that there's justice for Satan? It does. Uh, it gives the impression. I think it, it is. I think it's not a fact. I mean, I served with uh, with Democrats who were who were who were funded by trial lawyers, and they did not vote based on who the clients were. They voted based on what the law was. Uh, so I don't know. They had different perceptions, different judicial philosophy. Uh, so, uh, so I think I think it is not a fact, but yeah, it does create a, 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 an impression. Now, the, the, I, I do have a problem though because it doesn't create that impression when someone is appointed, even if all that money's there. What we're suggesting, if we say, well, because of this impression, we can't trust the public to understand what's really going on. We've got to hide from them the politics that's going on. We've got to keep all this behind closed doors. We've got to have them not know what money's going into the governor's fund, for example, uh, in order to, to assure that the governor will appoint the people that, that, that someone wants. We need to keep all this secret that the strength of democracy depends upon the ignorance of the electorate. And I just I just can't accept that. I, I, think, I think it is far better to have it out in the light of day. People can look at it. They can see where I got my money. They can see where she got her money. They can and, and, and they can decide. Is this someone? Yeah, I'd like to ask the witness to answer me yes or no. Uh, yes or no. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would I would point out in the interest of full disclosure that Sue Bell Cobb, Justice uh, Sue Bell Cobb, is my law school classmate. And uh, two years ago, we had our 25th uh, reunion at the University of Alabama. She was in the midst of her campaign. I only wish that she had discovered uh, then. Uh, that raising $2.6 million was unacceptable. Well, she sure twisted everybody's arm in her class. As she very probably should have done. And uh, as, as her classmate, I'm delighted for her. Uh, Justice C., uh, you now have five minutes to, uh, to subject uh, General Summers to cross examination. And, and ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, please submit them in writing so we can uh, uh, have questions from the audience uh, when uh, General uh, Summers is. is uh, Finished being cross-examined by Justice. Yeah, I, I guess uh, the the implication in, in the things that you will not have if you don't have uh, uh, elections, the things that will be uh, removed, uh, is that, that under presumably under Tennessee or any other plan, uh, you won't have politics. Can you explain to me how you keep politics out of the commission? Uh, well. 
you can't. Uh, it would be naive of me. I said no politics. I meant not the kind of politics that you've got in parts of the budget. Instead, it's no, behind the door politics. Well, let me, let me explain. You keep talking about behind the door politics, but I've been through. I've been. I've been through both. I've been. I've been through the partisan election as a district attorney, but I've also been through the selection process, and. I really don't know what you're talking about when you're talking about behind the door politics. The, it's all out in the open. The only thing that's not out in the open is the closed interview of the Judicial Selection Commission. The public hearings are in the open. John J. Hooker can come, Ammon Smart can come, Mac Davis can come, and they can testify of what a no good, low down son of a bitch you are, and you should never be a judge. Or they can say that, that you are pure as a driven snow, you're quintessential, and you're the best thing since sliced bread. That's all out in the open. The evaluation process is all out in the open. The evaluation process is printed in five newspapers in March before the election. I don't know what I don't know what's closed about that. Well, I, yeah, and, and I guess I guess what I what I'd be concerned about is what gets said to these folks uh, elsewhere. What do you mean? Well, outside of the commission, they don't. They they, they aren't talked to by folks. You can the, the commission. The commission can talk to anybody they want to. People. They have a public hearing where where the people line up. People line up in a room in a hotel room, and they they have they have people testify before the commission about it. You can submit letters. You can submit affidavits. They can do anything they want. Well, let, let, let me let me ask you another question. Uh, we 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 managed to do away with partisanship also. So a person's political affiliation is irrelevant in this election process. Yes, sir, it is. Matter of fact, matter of fact, right now, back 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 in nineteen back in nineteen ninety when that Supreme Court was was elected, there were five Democrats. Matter of fact, two of two two good judges were replaced at that time. Uh, now you got well, you've got three Republicans, maybe two and a half Republicans. You've got three Republicans on the Supreme Court and two Democrats right now on the, on the Tennessee Supreme Court. And since that time, we've had Republican governors and Democratic governors. And some Rep Democratic governors have appointed Republican appointees. Well, I, if you know a whole lot more about Tennessee and, and how it operates than I do. I would find that surprising, and I would find it surprising if it continued. Uh, if in fact you do have a commission that is, you know, that is, that is completely uh, open and uh, nonpartisan and non-political and not influenced uh, by it uh, in any way, um, let's see. Well, I, I, I have one other question, but let's get one. Well, I, I have a, a first uh, question that I have for both uh, advocates is as follows, and uh, please do submit your written questions. Judge Bill Pryor of the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit has written and spoken on the subject of judicial independence uh, on a number of occasions, and he has argued that the greatest protection of judicial independence is judicial restraint. Do you agree with Judge Pryor about judicial restraint being the greatest protection of judicial independence? And if you agree or disagree, how does your agreement or disagreement inform your view on whether the election of judges is good or bad public policy? That's a complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, I will go first. Um, I, 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 I agree with uh, Judge Pryor. And it, and it seems to me uh, the, the thrust of the point is the one I made all too briefly, but you know, we have a limited amount of time uh, that, uh, that I alluded to. Uh, if judges are activist judges, if they do more, and, and, and yeah, look, look back in history until, uh, well, until certainly before the 1920s, uh, no judge would have thought of interpreting some statute to mean the opposite of what it really says. Uh, with the 1920s, we had this uh, this movement in legal education to convince people judges ought to be policy makers, uh, and uh, if the legislature's wrong, they ought to, to correct uh, the legislature. Well, when judges become activists, when they start making policy instead of letting the legislature make policy, when judges start making policy, 
it becomes very valuable to have the right judge on the bench to, to, to a number of interests. So instead of, instead of lobbying the legislature, all they need to do is start investing in the judiciary. That creates the very problems that we've been talking about here. That's why there's a lot of money in it, because there are judges who don't act like judges, they act like legislators. And it's worth money to folks to, 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 to have the right policies to being made. Uh, if, if, if instead they uh, exercised uh, reasonable uh, judiciary state, that was the general uh, practice, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see all of that investment. Uh, it also uh, Well, I'm not sure we disagree. Bill Pryor, who's a former colleague of mine, and now in the appellate court. Let me digress. Judge Bivens is here from, he's a Nashvilleian, but he's former from New Mexico. Now he has a unique, Judge Bivens over here has a unique standing because he has been elected in partisan races for the Court of Appeals in New Mexico, and then New Mexico changed it to judicial merit selection, and he's been retained and, and elected under that process, merit, merit selection. And what he told me before we, we uh, what he told me before we got started today was he sure likes the merit selection a lot better because the last time he ran, he only spent 37 cents. 75. 75 cents. And that was to mail two stamps. To ask to be retained to, you know, have his name on the ballot. <laughs> Judicial restraint. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if anybody really knows how to define judicial restraint. It seems like judicial restraint usually is defined by the one who loses the case. For example, the Kelo case in the United States Supreme Court in February of 2005. Not a big deal. I call it Kelo. It may be pronounced Kelo versus uh, uh, Township of North New Haven. The Kello case, K-E-L-O case, uh, involving uh, blighted areas. Uh, Justice Stevens wrote the opinion. Uh, he basically, in a 5-4 decision, uh, Justice Stevens said, you know, we are, this is a judicially restrained opinion because what we're doing is we are deferring back to local government. We are deferring the decision as to what is a blighted area, whether a piece of property can be taken by inverse, common, inverse condemnation or eminent domain. We are relegating that, that back to local government. He said, and the commentator said, that's a case of judicial restraint. The four dissenting on Kelo, or Kelo said, uh-uh. That's judicial activism. That's judicial activism. They're reading something into the Constitution that's not there. So I'm not so sure what is judicial restraint. The only thing I've ever been able to see is that when you don't like the decision, you say, well, we've got an activist court. But if you like the decision, you say, well, they just interpret the Constitution properly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and a lot of people do say that. But it seems to me, you know, just apply your mind to it. You've seen judicial activism, you've seen judicial restraint. You've seen judges who applied the law whether they agreed with it or not. You've seen judges who changed the law because they didn't like it. Uh, and uh, on, on, the, on the issue of which, you know, which a judge likes better, the day after I was elected, a newspaper reporter asked me, he said, after all you've been through, wouldn't you rather have been appointed? And I said, yeah, and for life. But, that, <laughs> <laughs> but that's not the question. The question isn't what would a judge like, yeah, I, yeah I, I can tell you lots of things. I'd like to be good for me. It's not supposed to be about us. It's supposed to be about the people. And it seems to me the people ought to have a right to hold us to their constitution. And if we start acting contrary to the constitution, they ought to be able to get rid of us. Let me say one more thing. In, in the judicial, I mean, you know, we all know that the legislative branch is supposed to express the views of the majority. The, the executive branch, John Jay, is supposed to express the views of the majority. Isn't the judiciary supposed to be there to protect the views of the minority when the majority is wrong? If it wasn't for that, then we wouldn't have Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka that overruled Plessy versus Ferguson. We wouldn't have that. 
if we did not have the judiciary protecting the minority against the majority when the majority is flat wrong. Um, thank you. I have some questions from the audience, and I've tried to, to group them by subject matter, and I'm going to paraphrase some of these. So uh, there are several questions on the same topic, and I'll try to combine them and paraphrase them. Uh, the first uh, question, and I think that this uh, probably is for you, General Summers, uh, with respect to the judicial evaluation process in Tennessee, how frequently have judges in Tennessee failed to receive the seven votes from the Judicial Evaluation Commission, that's part one. And uh, the part two of that question is how frequently have judges failed to pass the yes, no retention vote. Uh, the first question about judicial evaluation. I don't know, but we've got, we've got 29 judges on the, uh, on the Intermediate Appellate Court and the Tennessee Supreme Court. So I don't know the, the votes, but the votes are a matter of public record. But anecdotally, uh, I know of I know of his of, I know one or two judges who have received seven to five votes in their favor. I know a judge who uh, received less than that, went back, asked for a rehearing, and was afforded a 7-5 vote in his or her favor. Uh, I do know that as to the second question, the retention rate is about 99.3%. The only judge who was not retained was Justice Penny White in the August 1996 election when she was not retained by a vote of, I think, 54% to 46%. And that was primarily over a death penalty case called State versus Odom. Well, and to, to summarize your answer, then, would it be correct to say that there has never been an occasion when the final evaluation process uh, failed to uh, recommend the judge for retention? To the best of my knowledge, the, the Judicial Evaluation Commission has always recommended that somebody be retained. So that would be 100%. 100%. I, this, this, these questions are for Justice C. Uh, what makes the electorate more informed? A judicial commission's review that's based upon statistical analysis or the, the 30 second soundbite commercial that says that a city judge is soft on crime or legislates from the bench? And the question doesn't have any inclination, but just like it on what I did. <laughs> uh, well, I think both. I, I, you know, as I, I suggested, I, I have no problem with people doing reports. I think the bar association ought to ought to generate that sort of information. I think the chamber of commerce ought to generate that information. I think other groups ought to, uh, you know, the trial lawyers, the other groups ought to generate that information. And typically, they do during an election. It is not just a thirty-second soundbite. Uh, and you know, there are mailings that go out, but there's also uh, you know, newspaper evaluations, editorials from around the state. And in fact, a lot of what those 30-second sound bites do is, is reflect what's been reported in the newspapers. Uh, the following is a multi-part question. Uh, and I will dispense with the first part uh, of the multi-part question and just go to the second and third parts. Uh, General Summers. Uh, since all present members of the Judicial Selection Commission are appointed by Democrats, and 14 of the 17 members are required to be appointed from lists proposed by lawyer groups, and 80% of Tennessee lawyers are Democrats, does that not make the Tennessee plan for retention elections partisan in favor of Democrats and lawyers? Uh, the, I think the question premised that the Judicial Selection Commission is appointed by Democrats. Well, the Judicial Selection Commission is appointed by the Speaker of the House and the Speaker of the Senate. And the Speaker of the Senate is a Republican and the Speaker of the House is a Democrat. Uh, what's the next one? Uh, the, uh, the Speaker of the House and the Speaker of the Senate, uh, who until uh, so recently, the term of Senator Wilder was, was a Democrat, 
uh, have to choose from lists proposed by lawyer groups, and 80% of Tennessee's lawyers are Democrats. Uh, does that not make the Tennessee plan for retention elections partisan in favor of Democrats and lawyers? I don't, I don't know if 80% or 80% of the lawyers in Tennessee Democrats. I see a bunch of lawyers in here, I bet you're not Democrats. <laughs> Do you see any at R? Is that your question? You know? <laughs> There's a reason why we require the question to be stated right. <laughs> I don't. I, I just can't. First of all, I can't believe Mac. Eighty percent of them. I mean, our lawyers are, are Democrats. Maybe eighty percent of the trial lawyers might be, but they're not all trial lawyers. They're some like us. They're some like. Mac Davis over at Waller, uh, uh, not trial on But uh, I mean, I mean, you, you're you're assuming. Let's just say, assuming that it's eighty percent, you, you, you make a good point. You make a good point. But I don't, I don't think I don't think your premise is correct. I don't, I'm sure I don't think eighty percent of the lawyers in Tennessee are Democrats. I sure don't think that. But I know damn well the speaker of the Senate is Republican. I tell you, after being 26 years the lawyer for the state Republican Party, I'm convinced that at least 80 percent of the lawyers. But how? But how do you explain that you got three Republicans on the Tennessee Supreme Court right there? And nobody, they're not. Huh? They all switched over and became Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> the follow up. The follow up to to this anonymous question. <laughs> Tennessee plan for retention election of judges is good public policy. Uh, why wouldn't similar retention elections of legislators and governors and county commissioners and the other elected officials not also be good public policy? I defer to you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard for me to separate those two. I, you know, we hear all this talk about, well, judges are different. Yeah, judges are different. Uh, yeah, judges are different. School board members are different. Uh, you know, uh, 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 legislators are different from uh, you know, mayors, and yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, judges are different. It seems to me the question is, is the public capable of knowing the difference? If the public is, then they can require that a mayor be the kind of person that, ought, that, that a mayor ought to be, that a legislator be the kind of person a legislator ought to be, that a, that a, a judge be the kind of person that a judge ought to be. And if, if the citizens cannot make that distinction, cannot understand what is different about judge and select judges based on that, then we got a bigger problem than whether we elect judges or appoint judges. We got a problem with a, a system of representative democracy that won't work because people can't handle it, can't 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 manage it. I, I I've seen them. I think they are capable of doing. It. I think they I think they do understand. What a judge's role is, and I think they make those those decisions based on whether they believe the person is going to fulfill that judicial function. The, uh, the Federal Society did a survey recently that the, the statistics were about 30 percent of the people had some fair understanding of how the how the judges were elected. I believe I believe the statistics were might have even been less than that. I know anecdotally myself. That when I was for almost eight and, a half, well, eight and a half years on the Court of Criminal Appeals, I had an office in my hometown. I had an office in Jackson. When I went to my Jackson office, I would stop at the hut. It's arrested. On my way to Jackson, the coffee drinking buddies of mine would say, Judge, where are you going today? I said, I'm going to court. They all knew I was an appellate judge. They always said, well, are you going to lock them up and throw away the key? I said, oh, I'm sure I would. So I go, to the, I go to Jackson, I sit on a panel, you may hear 12 cases, I come back to the hut, I get a Coca-Cola, I walk in there, this, primarily the same guy that would say, well, Judge, did you put a bunch of them in jail? Oh, yes. How many did you put in jail? All oh, 12 or 14. I just told them whatever they wanted to hear, because the point is, they didn't have a clue about what I did. Now, finally, one of my coffee drinking buddies said, Tell me exactly what kind of judge you are. And I started to explain to him about an appellate judge and what they did. And, and he got so confused. And finally I said, you know those guys on the Supreme Court that are all when you see them on television and stuff and hearing the case? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's kind of what I do. It's not as big a court as that, but it's kind of what I do. He had an idea then in his mind. 
I'm sure it wasn't exactly right. The uh, truth of the bit is, it, people don't know. Unfortunately, it's not because of, it's not because of, of meanness. It's primarily because of lack of education, or maybe it might be lack of interest. I don't know. But unfortunately, they do not know. <laughs> uh, it was about uh, whether uh, selection, uh, the merits of selection, would also justify selecting legislators and, and other candidates. You know, I, I think. Well, and, and there are a number of questions that were submitted on the same uh, topic, following up on your, your comment about uh, the removal of gender and racial bias uh, in elections. Um, and, and I'm going to have to paraphrase uh, those, those questions because uh, there, there are four on this very topic. Um, but if your is it your point that racial and gender bias is an ineradicable inherent aspect of any contested partisan election? And and if so, and if that can only be cured by a detention merit process, then why doesn't that also argue in favor of a retention merit process for legislators, governors, county commissioners? Well, you know, it, it may be something that could be explored, but I don't think it will as a practical political matter. Uh, racial and gender bias is something that really is diluted tremendously Bob Wiedemeyer in the Judicial Selection Commission process, in the Judicial Evaluation Commission process. Statutorily in Tennessee, racial and gender bias is addressed uh, in selecting the members of the Judicial Selection Commission. It intentionally, statutorily is placed in there to give the selectors an opportunity and it recommends that they select people who are conscious of racial, ethnic, gender, and geographical diversity. I'm not suggesting that it's perfect, but I'm suggesting that it certainly is cognizant, and certainly is statutory, and certainly is on the minds of the people who do the appointments. My follow-up question to you is that does the fact that the first African-American elected statewide in the state of Alabama was a member of the Alabama Supreme Court, and that this occurred in the 1970s, and the fact that in the 1970s a female justice to the Alabama Supreme Court was elected statewide uh, serve as facts that would uh, suggest that perhaps uh, racial and gender bias is not an irradicable inherent aspect of judicial elections, at least in the state of Alabama. Are they still serving? Uh, they retire. Well, I'm going to be. No, but they quit. Yeah, they, they, those two both retired. They, well, I can tell you, I can tell you that in in 19, I think it was 1988, 19 circa 1988. Uh, the first black on the Supreme Court was a Republican. Back. And that was George Brown from Memphis, and he was selected by Lamar Alexander, who was a Republican. And two years later, Frank Drawota, a Democrat, beat him in a statewide contested race. And that, although Frank Drawota certainly is a great judge, has been a great judge, and certainly my friend, uh, there hadn't been a black on the Tennessee Supreme Court until until Al Hurts came on there, he, he, and he was he was selected under the retention plan. Uh, I know anecdotally in Tennessee that it's a lot harder for a black or a minority to be elected statewide than it would be if he or she was selected under the retention plan. In my opinion. Uh, time to, uh, to give our advocates uh, five minutes each for uh, a closing statement and uh, going in reverse order from the opening statements just to see if you would like to give your closing statement. I had deferred to hit twice. <laughs> <laughs> other questions. You have five Uh, 
just ask, isn't it the job of judges to protect minorities? And, 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 I, and I think, I, I, I think, I look at the job of the judge differently, and I tell you, the job of the judge is to apply the law. Uh, and uh, that should protect minorities. I mean, you don't, you don't, because you disagree with it, change it for minorities, disadvantage it seems to me it's the very problem we were talking about a little while ago, this distinction between judicial activism and judicial conservatism. I, I think I'm being fair if I say a judicial activist is someone who believes it's the job of the judge to do what's right. And a judicial conservative is someone who says it's the job of the judge to do what the law requires. I tell folks, I hope, when you make a decision about whether to whether to, to vote for someone to judge or not, to, you know, whether to, to re-elect them or not, that you look at what they've done and you ask not, did I like the decision? But was it a decision that followed the law? If, they, if, if the judge decided the way you like, it didn't follow the law, you ought to vote against it. If, 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 the, uh, uh, if, if the judge decided in a way you don't like, but follow the law. You ought to vote for that judge and against that legislature. Because the legislature ought to be the one who are deciding what the law is, who are making uh, the policy. As I said a little earlier, I think this is a question of constitutional dimension. We have judges who believe that they ought to do what's right. And they know what's right. I might agree with them. But my freedom depends on the judge applying the law, on that separation of powers, so the judges aren't autocrats. You know, we don't want all that power concentrated in, hand, in, in a few hands. That's the reason for the separation of powers. And so I think the way you protect folks is by making sure that judges follow the law. They don't change the law depending on who the party is. I think if we do that, we did that, you know, we wouldn't have this problem. That's Bill Pryor's point. But you know, more important than that, if we're going to be making these decisions, should it be a commission of lawyers who, as I mentioned, have the deficit of legal education to overcome? <laughs> uh, they, they, they've been trained that don't know it's a question of policy and what should you know, what should you do? Is it should it be that group of lawyers? Or should it be the public at large? Hmm? And, 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 you know, I, I, frankly, I'd be just as unhappy if it were a group of realtors. I'd be just as unhappy if it were a group of, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, salesmen or something like that. Because I have faith in the public. I think the public understands. Now, okay, yeah, yeah, we got, if, if there's a problem, it seems to me the answer ought to be not to tell them what they want to hear, but to tell them the truth. Elections can educate. So let's tell people why they ought to vote for me. Because by golly, I'm going to apply the law. I'm not going to be making policy. But I think they understand that already. If they understand that already, then, and, they, and they care, they want the Constitution to be followed the way the Constitution is written, they got to have the right to do that. They have the right to vote for judges who share their view of the Constitution. There's some fellow you may have heard of named Davy Crockett, who you may recall was a congressman. He went to Washington, D.C., served as a congressman. While he was there, they just opened up Washington, D.C. We just, just moved there. And there were some houses that burned down. And so Congress got together and said, you know, we need to help these folks. And they appropriated money to rebuild those houses. When it came time for re-election, Davy Crockett was out in East Tennessee. He came upon a farmer, the old farmer. Now, I don't know what the conversation was. I could picture if he was close to that rail fence, Davy probably put his foot up on that rail fence. If not, he probably walked out into the field. He said something like, I'm guessing, I, I've been down there. I said, my name's Davy Crockett. I'm your congressman, and I appreciate your vote for re-election. We do know what the farmer said. He said, I can't vote for you. Davy Crockett said, why not? He said, well, you remember those houses burned down? You used federal money to rebuild those houses? He said, I don't think the Constitution allows you to do that. Keep in 
can agree or disagree with that karma. But he had a theory of the Constitution. He was going to hold his congressman to it. You may remember when, when, when David Crockett went to, to Texas, uh, Santa Ana was the governor of the, of the province of Texas, for the part of Mexico at the time. Santa Ana wrote a letter in which he complained about these Americans, probably, what, 40% of whom were probably Tennesseans, complained about these Americans running around with a copy of the Constitution in their pockets, demanding their rights. It's the people who are responsible for the Constitution. And if we have judges who are not abiding by the Constitution as people understand, people ought to be allowed to remove it. General Summers, your closing argument. Thank you. Uh, I don't think we differ too much. What I said earlier was that judges are supposed to protect the minority when the majority is wrong. When the majority is wrong. In 2004, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce won 12 out of 13 judicial races. In 2006, nationwide, business donors contributed twice as much as lawyers to judicial races. In 2004, in the Illinois Supreme Court race, which cost $9.3 million, one justice got a $350 thousand dollar from an insurance uh, contribution from an insurance company and after this justice was elected sat on a case dismissing a 456 million dollar case against that particular insurance company and the list goes on and on and on judges should be independent Judges shouldn't wear black robes. They ought to wear black and white striped robes like referees because that's what they are. I'm not suggesting at all that, and I'm certainly not arguing at all, that just because you do not run in a partisan race, then you are going to be a judicial activist. I think, I think Anecdotally, look at Tennessee. I don't, I don't think anyone could prove a case there in Tennessee that we have a lot of judicial activism just because we have a merit selection plan. Nor do I agree with Justice C's argument that a popular election insulates by intimidation. By intimidation. Judi us from judicial activism. Judicial act. What is that? Judicial activism. That's when they rule not in my favor. That's when they rule not in my favor. That's what judicial activism is. It all depends on bad fun for Nashville and Tennessee. It all depends on who's being gold. <laughs> Talking about judicial activism. It all depends on who's being gold. I suggest. Chief Justice Sue Bell Cobb of Alabama got it right. She said that people need to have faith in the courts. We don't need to be raising and spending $2.6 million. Raging, raging that kind of ridiculous money does not give us an independent judiciary. And I would also suggest that Justice Sandra Day O'Connor retired, also got it right, when she said, when we put cash in the courtrooms, it's just flat wrong. Thank you very much. I want to thank our advocates and uh, thank once again uh, Bolt Cummings, Congressman Berry for their uh, wonderful hospitality today. I would conclude as the moderator by observing that our advocates have uh, one thing certainly in common. Uh, 
Justice C. As a young man, worked uh, as a as a sheet metal worker uh, and uh, uh, in uh, in, in uh, uh, as a roofer and uh, in construction. Uh, General Summers uh, worked uh, uh, in agriculture at an uh, egg farm. Was responsible for uh, 130. Thousand chickens, or seven hundred eighty thousand, seven hundred eighty thousand hens. <laughs> I think that they, would, despite their disagreements today, I think they would both agree that what they're doing today beats the heck out of. <laughs> <laughs>